Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the New Negro Movement in a Global Perspective, a professional development webinar sponsored by Primary Source and America in Class from the National Humanities Center. <clears throat> My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs at the Humanities Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. Before we get underway, let me say a few words about the sponsors of our program. The National Humanities Center is located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, and is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. Our main program is a fellowship program that brings scholars from this country and abroad to the center to research and write on topics in the humanities, the uh, history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We offer a wide array of programs for teachers under the brand America in Class, you have found our webinars, and if you go to americainclass.org, you'll discover all of the other rich uh, teaching resources we offer for American history and literature. Primary source, our co-sponsor of this night of this evening's session, <clears throat> is a nonprofit that partners with teachers in school districts to advance global understanding to students. Primary source offers more than 65 programs each year in history, humanities, and global studies, many of them fully online. They also create multimedia online resource guides and curriculum activities that emphasize teaching with diverse primary resources from around the world. They have put together for us this evening a Pinterest site. Uh, the librarians and, and the program directors have curated this site. Uh, it includes primary and secondary resources for teachers who want to bring a global view to their teaching of African American history between the world wars. The Pinterest board includes links to classroom lessons, book recommendations, and websites with primary source collections. The URL for this website uh, is on the, uh, uh, our website, the website for this program, the uh, uh, New Negro Movement and Global Perspective website. It is also in the seminar form, and we have included it in the email messages we have sent to you. So it's widely available. Please check it out. It will give you uh, access to a rich array of resources for teaching the Harlem Renaissance and the New Negro Movement in a global perspective. When the seminar is over, please go to uh, the website for this webinar because there you will find a recording of the program. We also archive the recordings on YouTube, recordings on YouTube so you can see it there. You will also find the PowerPoint. Uh, please feel free to plunder the PowerPoint. Use it in your classes. That's what it's there for. In addition, you'll find an evaluation. Please fill that out and send it to us. Uh, we pay attention to what you tell us, and we try to improve our programs on the basis of what we learn in your evaluations. Once we have received your evaluation, you'll be able to download a certificate documenting your participation, and you'll be able to submit that to your local certifying authority to obtain whatever recertification credit your participation warrants. And how do you participate? Well, our seminar leader this evening will be uh, lecturing and making comments and stopping from time to time to pose discussion questions. We would like you to respond to those by putting your cursor in that green box that I bracketed there on the screen. You'll see it in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Type your message, hit that send button to the right, and your message will appear in the large chat box above. I will be watching the chat all evening and bringing your comments and questions into the conversation. And please, do not wait for us to ask a question. Um, if you have a question or you have a comment, please send them to us in the chat. Give us feedback on how you teach this material. If you see some material in the seminar that is usable in class, let us know how you would present it. If you see a potential project or assignment, share that with us. Remember, the more you participate, the better the webinar will be. Well, let's get underway. We are very pleased to have with us tonight DeVarian Baldwin, the Paul E. Rayther Distinguished Professor of American Studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. DeVarian is, uh, he studies uh, African American uh, culture and history. In 2009, he published Chicago's New Negroes, Modernity and the Great Migration and Black Urban Life. So let me turn the program over to DeVarian, make sure his microphone is turned on. It is. DeVarian, please tell us what the New Negro Movement looks like from a global perspective. It's all yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much. First of all, I want to say hello to everyone who is uh, participating. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I always have, when I have the opportunity to work with teachers, it's always a pleasure because it always makes me think more about not just the science, but the art of teaching. So it's always a pleasure. Um, the New Negro Movement, or in some classes it might be discussed as the Roaring Twenties or the Harlem Renaissance, 
is something that you all at some level are probably required to teach, but there's an opportunity to kind of situate it within a global perspective. So the Harlem Renaissance is usually understood as a literary and cultural experience of Harlem, New York. Um, so today we're going to say, well, what happens if we expand that notion and, and situate the Harlem Renaissance within its actual historical context when it was understood as one part of a new Negro experience that was social, political, and cultural movement that spanned the globe? Then we'll move to kind of historical understandings of this larger new Negro experience that has not really um, been uh, carried forward into the scholarship um, by looking at one text by um, the author Lothrop Stoddard, The Rising Tide of Color. And then we'll look at Black intellectuals and activists' responses to his alarm about what he saw happening globally with their response of the tide has started and will continue to rise. And then we'll ask the question, why has the new Negro experience been confined to the Harlem Renaissance? This is going to be my introductory comments to shape what we will discuss thereafter. And again, as Richard said, if you have questions, need me to slow down, that's totally fine. I'm happy to do so um, because I have such passion for the material. So sometimes I go too fast. Um, so... This image here of the cover for the survey graphic, which was a um, social uh, a kind of social work magazine or journal based out of New York, um, is the way that we've come to understand the new Negro, the Harlem Renaissance. It's it's actually it was a um, a social work journal, but was in this special edition took advantage of the arts and sculpture and the visual culture of African Americans based largely but not exclusively in Harlem. And this is how we come to know the Harlem Renaissance as basically being the literary and cultural experiences exclusive to Harlem. But when we look at the archive and look at this one image here of a uh, Marcus Garvey parade of the United Negro um, Industrial Association, we have the same image, the same, the same uh, terminology, the new Negro, but in a much more expansive social environment. Uh, the new Negro has no fear. So um, here we see the New Negro um, in the same context, the same time period, but as a cultural, political, and social movement that spanned the globe uh, from Harlem to Havana, from Paris to Port-au-Prince. So um, the question becomes, well, well, what happened to this image? And, and why don't we talk about this now? And so if we go back to the archival period, um, it wasn't just African-Americans who were aware of uh, the New Negro as a social, political, cultural and global movement. Uh, Lothrop Stoddard, who we have here with the kind of snarly mustache, uh, was a well-known intellectual and scholar of the 19 teens and 20s, um, who actually, and, and he wrote this very famous and uh, best-selling book, The Rising Tide of Color, The Threat Against White World Supremacy. Now, you might think there's some kind of fringe um, text, but it actually it was, it was quoted by presidents. Um, it actually was referenced in uh, The Great Gatsby. Um, and it was a book that had a significant um, um, appeal to many people who saw what was happening across the globe and wanted to understand what was going on. Now, Stoddard didn't just stop at text. He actually offered um, a visual context to what he was attempting to articulate with his words. This is a map that he inserted into, the, into his uh, text. Um, it's actually not a factional, a factual map. It's actually a fictional map that speaks more to his sounding the alarm about racial invasion across the globe than it does about the actual uh, demographic uh, disbursement of different peoples of different races across the globe. So on the map, the red actually represents um, the so-called Caucasian race. Uh, the brown represents the uh, Hispano race, if you will, what today we might call uh, Lat Latinos and Chicanos. The, uh, the yellow represents the Amer-Indian race, and the gray represents the Africans. So it's really interesting to see how he attempted to visually represent his alarm about the rising tide of color across the globe that had little to do with the actual disbursement of different racial groups across the world. But what it did do, oops, excuse me, what it did do was sound the alarm about some factual things that were going on. Um, there, it was real that Japan was on the rise against Europe, fighting back against European imperialism. It was uh, true that the so-called mongrel race of Russia was putting forward an idea of Bolshevism. Um, it was true that there was a huge level of anti-colonial resistance in the Middle East, Asia, and Africa that brought to life what Stoddard called the phantoms of internationalism. So in the classroom, I might take this map 
and, and place it next to um, an actual map of racial demography, if you will, or ethnic demography, to talk about the fictional degree of the map, but not to dismiss its, its validity, but to talk about the degree to which the map is not really a factual representation of demographics, but as an expression of uh, a starter sentiment that was catching hold in so-called uh, white communities across the globe about what was going on. While this map is global, in his text, Stoddard was most critical about what he saw as the, quote, most chronic and most acute dangers of this rising racial tide taking place in the U.S. that he said, described as the mere Negro problem after the end of slavery. He described after slavery the rise of the Great Migration, um, he described, quote, unquote, the great Negro quarters of, ne of New York, Chicago, and other northern cities as, quote, unquote, cauldron seething with ideas and emotions. And the great thing about Stoddard was that he was a real student of African-American history. He knew about Du Bois. He knew about Garvey. He knew about the African Blood Brotherhood. Um, he knew about the attempts by the Soviet Union um, to link up the idea of an anti-racial republic with African-Americans who were facing Jim Crow in the South and racism in the North. He knew about all these things, and he talked about the alarm of uh, the, of, of this new Negro spirit. So the important thing about it is that um, he understood the new Negro in a global context. While African Americans uh, rejected Lothrop Stoddard's call to reassert white supremacy, which is what he was calling for, we need, we need to reassert white supremacy, um, black scholars and newspapers agreed that there was a racial reckoning that was near. W.E.B. Du Bois had long argued that the American race relations were, quote, but a local phase of a world problem. But West Indian uh, American intellectual Hubert Harrison um, was actually directly impressed with Stoddard's rising tide and engaged in a correspondence with Stoddard. But Harrison made clear, quote, naturally, since I am a Negro, my sympathies are not at all with you. That which you fear for, I naturally hope for. And then here we have a, a cartoon from the widely dispersed Chicago Defender, which mocked the boogeyman will get you if you don't look out. And so if you look at this image here, uh, we have um, William Jennings Bryan as a dog being pulled by Woodrow Wilson as the, uh, uh, the so-called rising tide of people of color or racial nations from Mexico to Japan, China to Latin America, um, India represented as the Hindu um, and then you got the British as a tiger hiding behind the tree. And then there's even a picture of the U.S. colored citizens. So again, the archive of this period understood this new Negro as far more than literary and cultural. And it also understood it as global. Um, so the question becomes, um, why do we understand this new Negro as strictly and limitedly as a literary and cultural movement that spurred the Harlem Renaissance. What happened to this global expanse of the New Negro movement as a social, political, and cultural experience that included the Harlem Renaissance, but was not simply contained in Harlem? Um, it took place in Chicago, in LA, but also in the South, but also in uh, Manila and Mexico City and Port-au-Prince and Port-au-Spain Port and Paris and Moscow, um, wherever people of color existed, they were connecting up what they considered to be themselves as the darker races as a part of or connected to this larger new Negro movement out of um, the U.S., but in a global expanse. So the Devane, Devane, if I could, <clears throat> if I, Devane, if I could just yeah. interrupt for a moment before we, <clears throat> we seem to have hit a pivotal place here where we're moving from the Harlem Renaissance to a global perspective, okay. and we have some questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. If we could go back to the map for a moment, okay, go back a few slides to the map, we have a question, how should we interpret the term primary races, which you see at the bottom of the map, mm -hmm. with our students? What does that mean? Ah, very good, okay. Um, well, the race in this time period is kind of tricky. Um, as you probably all know as teachers, the, the way in which we use, uh, they use race back then is a term that we would use today, ethnicity, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, the Irish were a race, the Italians were a race, the Jewish were a race, uh, the Negro or, or Africans were a race. So what they understood, so, but the thing about it when it came to, to whiteness, there was, there was the Irish race, 
there was the Jewish race, there was the Italian race, but then there was the umbrella category of white or Caucasian. So they, it right. was th these, these other groups that we call ethnicities were considered as subcategories under the white race. So mm -hmm. it would be important to tell teachers, students, that the, the term ethnicity doesn't really come into existence until the 1930s. And that was the attempt on the part of the United States to distinguish themselves from uh, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Because in, in truth, in the 20s, the, the U.S. vision of race was very similar to the, the Nazi vision of race, the Italian vision of race, the fascist vision of race. So in the 30s, the, the rise of the term ethnicity becomes a way for the U.S. to distinguish itself from these overtly white supremacist um, nations in a time of fascism. Okay. And we have, uh, I hope so, we have another question, which I think will help um, clarify this. A uh, participant asked, is there a key for the map? We don't have it on the slide, but uh, we will, uh, Devarian, if you'll send us that, the, the key, yeah. we will put this on the seminar forum. So no you'll problem. be able to obtain the key for the map on the yes. form. And then we have a question here about Lothrop Stoddard. If you could tell us a little bit more about him. And um, <clears throat> um, the participant asks, why is it significant to equate him with the Harlem Renaissance instead of scholars like Du Bois and Locke? We are safe to say we're going to get to Du Bois and Locke, no problem. Uh, but your point about Stoddard, though, was that in a, in a kind of... Um, uh, subverted, uh, topsy-turvy way, uh, a racist way, he was aware of the global spread of the new Negro spirit. He viewed it with alarm, fair to right. say? That's right. Right. And others did not. So uh, it's kind of ironic that this, this uh, white fellow is aware of this, and he's, he's alerting people to it as a, as a, as a, as a threat whereas others are going to see it as something positive. So I think, I hope that that uh, helps clarify for our participant here uh, why uh, Lothrop Stoddard figures into this, but I assure everyone we're going to get to Du Bois and Locke. Yes, we are. <laughs> uh, we, yes, I'm sure. We have another comment here. I often wonder about the nature of logistics of communication. Ah, good point. It can be interesting to get students thinking about how the means of communication can dictate how information is received in short, receiving a letter is different from receiving a text. That's a really good question. Uh, how how did are we going to get to the the way this consciousness spread? Uh, would it be fair to introduce that now, or shall we defer yeah. that? What's your, I mean, let's defer that because we are going to talk about that. And if 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 anyone who raised the question as we're talking about the dissemination of this of this movement um, still has questions in more detail, please re mm -hmm. you know reposition the question. I'd appreciate that. Um, okay. All right. And we've, we've got another. Oh, okay, question along the same lines, thinking about, uh, thinking along the lines of how folks worldwide were sharing the spirit. So definitely we're going to get to that question of dissemination. Okay, and here, uh, here we have a comment from Susan, uh, one of our participants. Stoddard has a PhD in history from Harvard. Shows how the historical perfection <laughs> functioned at the turn of the century. Uh, okay, well, Devarian, shall we move ahead then? I hope we've answered everybody's question. I, I just want to keep... Uh, Richard, I just, I mean, because this is a good sure. segue. Um, the point you made about what I'm trying to do with Stoddard is, 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 is spot on. The point being is that in our reception of the Harlem Renaissance, we've seen it in a very limited framework. My point about Stoddard is that if we go back into the historical archive, even those who were against it understood it as a global movement, as not just a cultural experience, but as a social, political, and cultural global movement, that there were more people were aware of this than were not aware of this. This is what I'm trying to say. So uh, this is an entree into reposition, into reopening the archive to examine the New Negro movement and the Harlem Renaissance within that as it was actually lived and understood. So great segue. Um, okay, well, let's move ahead then. Yes. And so... Um, here we have one of the earliest kind of uh, late 19th century, turn of the 20th century articulations of the New Negro movement that wasn't based in strictly art or visual culture. Um, this is the text, A New Negro for a New Century, that was um, co-authored by Booker T. Washington, N.B. Wood, and Fanny Barrier Williams. The important thing about this text, it is coming directly after the specter of slavery and in the moment of Jim Crow. And the question that's arising all over the country is, well, what do we do with Negroes who are not bound to plantations? They become a problem. This is the rise of the notion of the Negro problem. 
the problem of the Negro that is not bound to the plantation or to the sharecropping system? What do we do? How do we incorporate them into the body politic? And so this is Booker T. Washington, amongst others, attempts to highlight the individual achievements of black citizens, including their military valor during the Spanish-American War. Um, soldiers, African-American soldiers that went abroad, and they continue to go abroad to prove, you know, through blood and bullets that they have a right to be considered uh, members of the body, pol body politic. But it's important to understand that this, this, this piece, this book, becomes a touchstone for a range of interpretations about the new Negro um, at the turn of the 20th century. Here we have one that's focused primarily on racial uplift, the idea that in exchange for our um, military valor, we should be included into the body politic. But that same year, there was the initial London Pan-African Conference um, that responded to Europe's mad scramble to carve up Africa after the Berlin Conference of 1885. Um, and then moreover, moreover, while this text focused on the loyal patriotism of Spanish-American war soldiers, um, there were others that hoped that places like Cuba and the Philippines um, would satisfy black ambitions to colonize a new home so that during the Spanish-American war, if the U.S. colonized these places, they might be places to create uh, republics or, or black spaces for African-Americans who could find no equality or liberty in the U.S. But then yet still, others looked at this moment and protested the oppression of people of color in America's expanding empire across the board. Even some celebrated the exploits of black soldiers like uh, David Fagan, who revolted from the US Army in the Philippines and joined the Philippine Revolutionary Army. So just to reiterate, the new Negro at the, in the 1900s could be the idea, could represent the idea of uplift among intellectuals especially it's found in the Spanish-American War. It could represent a bid for a colonization within the American empire, or it could embrace what was considered to be a transnational rebellion against empire in all its forms, including the U.S. expansion throughout the um, Latin America and the Pacific. So this is a critical moment at the turn of the 20th century. We have already at least three different approaches to what the new Negro could mean. As we move forward um, a decade, 1910, um, the New Negro shifts a bit. Um, this 1910 is a significant signpost because it marks, number one, the official naming of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People and the start of its landmark magazine, The Crisis. But at the same time, 1910 also signals the moment when a young Marcus Garvey began um, engaging in transnational organizing against uh, helping to rally black workers against the United Fruit Company as it was expanding throughout Central America. So those are two ways, the rise of the NAACP in this magazine, The Crisis, the rise of Marcus Garvey in Jamaica, who goes throughout Latin America, particularly Costa Rica, and rallying black workers to fight against United Fruit in Central America. And then still a third way in 1910 is this powerful um, representation, oh, it's only one image, it's supposed to be two images, I apologize, um, representation of Jack Johnson, um, point, appointed as, self-appointed as the Negro's deliverer, who trounced, who was uh, the gentleman who was called the great white hope, Jim Jeffries. Now what's important here is that this is the same time period, 1910, um, Jack Johnson, um, was, I'm sorry, heavyweight boxing at this time period was represented as a physical manifestation of the reason why white people are superior. At this time period, African Americans were banned from boxing in heavyweight championship bouts. But then for some reason in 1908, Jack Johnson was allowed to fight Jim Burns in, of all places, Australia. He won. The white world was in alarm. And then two years later, they asked the former champion, Jim Jeffries, to come out of retirement to become the great white hope. And so it was white America that tied, or the white world, that tied the heavyweight championship boxing to white supremacy. So when Johnson knocked Jim Jeffries on the canvas in 1910, African-Americans took it upon themselves to say, look, to take the lies that you put out there, that boxing is an expression of racial superiority, then the black man, the black woman, must be superior to the white world. And so after this, there were a series of impromptu, spectacular uh, uh, um, uh, parades, celebrations, um, uh, black women, uh, threw black, white women off of uh, streetcars in celebration, not just in the North, but also in the South. 
and then white soldiers who are on leave got together into small bands and went into black communities trying to reassert racial order, but black people responded in what could be described as possibly the first ever nationwide race riot in U.S. history in response to uh, the, the, the support and the, but again, it wasn't just about Johnson's victory, it was about the black collective response to celebrate this as a moment of if not black racial equality, some said black racial superiority. Soon thereafter, Johnson uh, was banned, uh, uh, sent up on racial slaving charges because his uh, white wife had been a former sex worker. And so when they went across straight state lines, he had been charged with uh, the Man Act of of the white slavery charge of bringing women for sale across state lines, even though she no longer been a prostitute. Of course, the, the American government used this opportunity to kind of put down this physical image of black superiority. He left, he fled, he fled the country, eventually uh, landing in Mexico at the very same moment that the U.S. was taking control over land in Mexico. And he told Mexicans there that uh, if, uh, that black people would stand with their Mexican brothers against the gringo invaders. Um, even if he didn't really mean it, the point being is that this, this black man, this boxer, was in Mexico at this very same moment when Mexico was engaging in its own revolutionary moment against both the landed gentry in Mexico, but also outside forces like the U.S. So the new Negro was literally spreading, was literally expanding its wings. Now, just Ryan, four years... Ryan, if I can just jump in here. Uh, <clears throat> we had a question about the soldier uh, who uh, rebelled Fagen. against Fagen. his name. How do you spell his last name? F-A-G-E-N. F-A-G-E-N, okay. And uh, to relate to the, to the question we had earlier about dissemination, you said that the Jack Johnson fight was... Uh, his first major victory was in Australia, and then he yes. was in Mexico. So... At the time, was the heavyweight champion of the world really a world-renowned figure? I can think of the enormous renown that came to uh, Muhammad Ali. Uh, he mm. was, you know, one of the most widely recognized people on the globe. Um, mm. Does are you suggesting here that uh, that Jack Johnson's uh, inter was he an international figure, and did he spread that consciousness throughout the world? Is he another is he a vehicle of dissemination for the global New Negro movement? Great, great point. Great question. Well, first of all, um, Jack Johnson was very different than Muhammad Ali. Was Muhammad Ali had his own very articulate ideas about political consciousness. Jack Johnson was pretty much about Jack Johnson. He was an opportunist. But because of the way in which the white world had framed the heavyweight championship boxing, uh, the heavyweight um, title, his mere presence, his mere victory was itself a challenge to the order of the day. Now, you mentioned about dissemination and communication. This boxing match took place at the same time as the rise of cinema as a way to transport ideas and images in a much more kind of um, a readily available way. So when Jack Johnson defeated Jim Jeffries in 1910, uh, revolutionaries in the Philippines were calling for the film. And it's important to note that the U.S. colonial officials in the Philippines banned the disseminates. And it was quick to, and, and Philippine revolutionaries were quick to make the link between the banning of the film and the anxieties around the rise of a Filipino revolutionary consciousness that could throw off the chains of U.S. occupation. So again, it wasn't necessarily Jack Johnson who did all this, but his mere presence in the context of the, of the world tying the boxing title to racial supremacy is what helped spur a range of anxieties and responses that included the technology of film, if that answers the question. Right. So, so he became a symbol not just for African Americans, but for all uh, racially oppressed people in all sorts of places in the globe. Right. And I see a, I see a statement here saying that Jack Johnson was not Jackie Robinson. And that, that might be true in one regard, in, 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 terms, in terms of the way we represent Jackie, John, Jackie Robinson as being kind of dignified, et cetera. But there were ways in which Jack Johnson's brashness, his, his, his foreign cars, his, his expensive suits, all these things represented a certain kind of black dignity and arrogance that was extremely appealing to people of color.
the sound. Uh, indeed, if you could log in and log out and come back in, that might solve it. Um, I apologize for that. There's, there's unfortunately, there's nothing we can do from this end. Okay, okay. the very end. Onward. Let's move forward. Okay, so, so just four years later, after 1910, now we're in the period of uh, 1914, 1915, where you have various strands of imperial expansion, and at the same time, anti-colonial resistance coming to a head during World War One. Um, new Negro cultural critics, activists, and laborers, they saw the Great War as something much more broad than simply the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. Um, they saw it as part of and the culmination of a 30-year-old European scramble for materials and men in Africa that began, you know, arguably with the 1885 Berlin Conference, where European nations sat down and uh, uh, carved up, as you see this image on the left-hand side, carved up and partitioned parts and made natural, uh, unnatural artificial boundaries around parts of Africa. Um, but also they did the same thing in Asia um, as well. And so many people, new, many new Negro activists and, 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 and observers saw World War I as, again, more than Franz Ferdinand, but as the culmination of this 30-year-old scramble um, over Africa. But it took someone, and someone mentioned Du Bois, and here we go, someone mentioned, uh, it took someone like Du Bois to offer a kind of intellectual critical overlay to make sense of at least what he saw as the African root. Um, and, and many of you probably don't know that much of the, 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 the military, the actual military front during World War I took place in Africa. So Du Bois observed that with the waning of the possibility of the big fortune, i.e. money and resources and men, gathered by starvation wage and violence exploitation of one's weaker and poorer fellows at home, arose more magnificently the dream of exploitation abroad. The laborer at home is demanding and beginning to receive a part of his share. The theory of his new democratic despotism has not been clearly formulated. The white working man has been asked to share the spoil of exploiting, quote, chinks and niggers. It is no longer simply the merchant prince or the aristocratic monopoly or even the employing class that is exploiting the world. It is the nation, a new democratic notion composed of united capital and labor. So what do you think Du Bois is saying here, talking about the rise, he's talking about the, 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 again, the African roots of war. What spurred this, this, this fight between Euro-American powers over resources, over land? What, do you, what is he trying to, what is he saying? How is he diagnosing this war? Okay, we have a question on the table. How will you interpret Du Bois's quote here? Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, let's, let's wait. We've got some people, <coughs> excuse me, typing in here. Sure. Uh, yeah, we're still here. We're waiting. Okay. I think he is commenting in part on the white exclusivity of the labor movement at the time. Good mm -hmm. point. Good point. We have some other folks typing in. Let's see what they have to say. And then we'll throw it back to you. It's not new. Remember the new world of the Americas. Okay. Exploitation mm -hmm. here in the new world. Uh, so nationalism covers <clears throat> uh, over class. Okay. And we have some other folks uh, responding and then we'll I uh, ask you to respond to Varian. Let's see. America's turn toward imperialism with an emphasis on the white man's burden. And mm -hmm. Pat Marshall is coming in with a comment here. Uh, while we're waiting for that, it I, I find it interesting that he's combined, uh, he's talking about a combination of, of white working men and capitalists um, mm -hmm. joining to uh, mm -hmm. uh, mutually exploit uh, Africa and the colonial world. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, here's Pat's comment. It's also a recognition that the Industrial Revolution and the increasing importance of resources has changed the way nations interact. Varian, we got a lot to work with there. How do you yes, respond? This is, I'm, 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 you know, I'm not surprised, but very impressed with the astute of observations about this quote. And, and everyone is in part right. Uh, what Du Bois is saying here, if you read the whole text, is that um, at the moment, as someone mentioned the Industrial Revolution, but also the labor revolution, particularly in Europe, you have this conundrum. You have nation states affording better working conditions and better pay to their working classes while at the capitalizing on unprecedented profit. So the boys asked the question, how can you have 
the expansion of rights and resources to the working class and at the same time have unprecedented profits where you have to begin to exploit abroad. So what happens is that you have the rise of the shift from the kingdom to the rise of the nation, particularly at the point of World War I. You have the coming together of capital and labor under the new banner of the nation as a racial convergence, as he says, sharing in the spoils of exploiting chinks and niggers abroad. That the only way you can have unprecedented wealth and expanded benefits to the nation is by finding other modes of exploitation. And so he says that as these different nations, France, Britain, uh, Germany, the U.S., begin to go abroad to find other forms of resource accumulation, they begin to run up against one another. And this becomes, so then they begin to struggle against each other for the accumulation of greater resources. So for him, this becomes a key part in roots of war, if that makes sense. I ask, the African Roots of War is the, the title of the text from which this quote is taken, that's, right? That's correct. Um, a piece. Um, okay, and that, is, that was. The 1915 Atlantic Monthly. Okay, and we included that among the readings, did we not? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I think we did. Okay, great. It was a participant asked. And we have a comment here. It's interesting that the oppressive system of imperialism requires more democratic ideas to work. Mm. Democratic at home, oppressive abroad. Right. Yeah, it's a coexistence. It's not an either or. It's not on a timeline where you go from oppression to democracy. They coexist at the same time, right? And that's an important mm -hmm. point. So Du Bois is on something. And, and again, this is someone who we see mostly in a U.S.-centric context, thinking abroad, thinking about what he called, what many people call the darker races, um, those from Asia, from Africa, from the Middle East, as a part of this larger way of ex understanding um, Euro, Euro as well. Um, so moving forward, uh, yeah, let me, let me uh, jump in. We have a participant who writes, is this the start of Du Bois' Pan-Africanism? Well, no, it's not the start because actually at that London Pan-African Congress in 1900, he was there. So mm -hmm. this is the continuation of his Pan-Africanism. I see. So it just elaborates his Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. He uses the pan. The important point though is that he uses the Pan African lens to interpret the World War One, something that had not been done. Uh huh. And we have another question here: uh, Is this, is Du Bois's comment, a criticism of Marx? Yeah, oh, that's interesting. I mean, yeah. labor uh, becoming the exploiting class—a very interesting question. All right, I'm gonna, I can't answer, Devarian. Right? I'm glad you're here. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's people have called actually not necessarily a crit criticism of Marx, but a, a, an analysis of the limits of Marx, a, a discussion of, the, of what people might call the Eurocentric nature of Marx, because for Marx, he thought that revolution was going to happen in the Euro-American metropoles, in the cities, in industrial spaces. But what he didn't anticipate or acknowledge was the degree to which um, this class consciousness was going to be overwritten by nationalism, by race by the way in which labor and, and, and capital would come together around the racial identity of nationalism. So this becomes a, a continuation, an extension, an elaboration on Marx, actually highlighting the limits of Marx, the, 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 the limits of Marx's um, blind spot as critical for understanding class, that they coexist. It's not either class or race, but it took African-Americans to say it's both, that race is the way in which classes live. You can't have either or. So I think this is really important, that in the context of the, the notion of the working man, what did it mean when the working man was understood as European only, as white only, as not linking up with their colonial brothers in Africa, in the, in, in the Philippines, in the West Indies? Right? right. We have a really good comment here that I think captures this. I think in this context, whiteness is the overarching shared trait. Not that the working man is any less significant, but you have a race of people combining to oppress another group. So here, race over class, fair to say? Well, in some ways, yes, but what he's saying, most, more poignantly, is that this is the rise of, na of the nation. The mm -hmm. nation is a racialized compromise between capital and labor. Oh, uh, okay. As a political unit. Uh-huh. And, 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 and for it to for it to exist without it turn, without there being implosion, it requires colonies. And the thing that maintains the distinction between nation and colony is race. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So yeah. what he so it, it, at this point in our history, if you were to talk to working men and you were to talk to capitalists, they would both agree in the imperialistic uh, designs of the nation on the on the grounds of being American, on the grounds of being French, on the grounds of being British, right. on the grounds of being right. German. So he's 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 he's, dying, he's he's highlighting this as a relatively new phenomenon. Particularly right. if you think about World War One, the maps after World War One are what carve up today what we understand as modern nations. Before that, they were kingdoms. They were empires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have a comment here. The rise of the nation then necessitates racial ranking or hierarchy. Well, the racial ranking and hierarchy become a way to organize the nation. So it's actually a little bit reversed. Okay, well, fascinating. This, this is, this is. I think we have uh, really gotten a lot of mileage out of uh, W. E. B. Here, um, yeah. we have a question about how this plays into our society today. Why don't we defer that uh, for yeah, the time? That that question will later. get to the end. But, uh, and then we also have a question of um, uh, the international workers of the world. Why don't we defer that one too? And shall we okay. move ahead? We've got sure. uh, about forty-five minutes. Okay, great. Okay, so. Um, this brings us actually to um, World War One and um, the post-war armistice that brought a particular urgency to the post-war New Negro consciousness. Um, at the uh, there was a 1919 Pan African Congress in pa conference in Paris, um, right next to the Versailles Peace Treaty meetings. At the same time, a number of um, uh, you know, pan-African, pan-racial, pan uh, colonial colonial groups got together or attempted to uh, get to the Versailles meetings, and they were denied. Um, a particular note was the short-lived International League of Darker Peoples that was created in 1919 on the estate of, of all people, beauty culturalist, Madam C.J. Walker. And the purpose of the organization was to bring together um, the darker races, African Americans, with other colonial subjects to proceed to pursue shared goals at the Paris Peace Conference. What they did was was astute was that at this time Japan was the only quote unquote non-white nation that had a seat or empire that had a seat at the um, Versailles Conference. They were considered the honorary um, you know uh, non-white uh, group people to be at the conference. So they invited the delegation from the Japanese um, group to come to Madam Walker's mansion on the Hudson as an attempt in the spirit of what she called race consciousness or racial solidarity to get the African-American question or the race question, actually not African-American, but the race question on the table of the Versailles Peace Treaty meetings. And Japan, for their own reasons, because they knew that as long as race was not on the table, they would always be considered a subsidiary member of the league. They did so. They attempted to put the race question, racial equality, as a 15th point onto the League of Nations platform. It was soundly rejected, particularly of all, by, of all nations, Australia, because Australia had just begun to rise to prominence because of its exploitation of um, um, uh, uh, colonial subjects in Asia. So and in Micronesia. And so the, uh, Australia, alongside other European nations, were soundly rejected the idea of putting racial equality as the as the 15th point, as the mysterious 15th point onto the platform. This uh, international league included um, a young Marcus Garvey, um, the, the pastor and politician A. Philip Randolph, I'm sorry, Adam Clayton Powell Sr., and the labor organizer A. Philip Randolph, alongside Madam Walker. Um, so at the same time as this attempt to get onto the platform, um, we see um, Woodrow Wilson and his 14 points. Um, he first outlined in this speech um, that he gave in 1918 the first, 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 fifth, the first 14 points. But the important thing about his 14, his 14 points and the League of Nations more broadly is that because it was a coming together of nations, his vision of self-determination did not include colonies. So therefore, it did not include um, non-white peoples across the globe, except for Japan. And so new mm. Negroes all over the world, particularly in the US, but also those of the darker races, they, they jumped on this. They jumped on the contradictions of Woodrow Wilson talking about self-determination as at the moment was occupying Haiti. Um, and they occupied Haiti from 1915 to 
1934. You had new Negroes across the world saying that Haiti had become America's Ireland and America's India, referring to the colonial history of, of Britain, particularly because of the ways in which they exported Jim Crow labor practices um, to Haiti. It's not, a, it's not a mistake that the, um, the, uh, the officers that were uh, appointed in the Haitian occupation were explicitly only, and almost exclusively only those of the South who had quote unquote inexperience with working with Negroes in the US. That became a, uh, a calling card, a point of distinction for, their be, for, their to become, for them to become officers in Haiti. So again, it's important to understand this global expanse, not just of the new Negro as a form of resistance, but it's responding to a globalized vision of white supremacy. So back in the US after the war, it's important to just look at this image for a minute. Um, the most striking thing, hopefully, you grab with this is that, given the era of Jim Crow, but also racial, um, racial, racial um, racism in the North, here we have an image of black men with guns marching down a street in New York City. This was a powerful image that brought another level of anxiety to not just the white world but white America in particular. This is the 369th U.S. Infantry, the Hellfighters. So in a period where there was a, a, the, still the, the, the residual ideas that black people were inferior based on biology, the, the phenomena of the, the Hellfighters receiving the Croix de Guerre, the highest honor in France for their bravery, became small challenges to the idea of blackness and a, and a biological inferiority. But beyond just simply challenging that notion, this, um, this infantry also with its band, the Hellfighters Band was one of the first groups to disseminate jazz music. So another form of communication, disseminate jazz music across the globe and particularly in Europe. Um, one of their most well-known uh, songs, um, How You Gonna Keep Them Down on the Farm, actually they didn't create this song. This was actually um, a song that had a little bit of history to it that had been written by I can't remember who, but it was circulated amongst white America as just simply a kind of a dance song that picked up speed during the Roaring Twenties. But then the band leader for the, for the, for the Hellfighters picked it up, James Reef Europe, and um, jazzed it up, gave it a jazz composition. But then at the same time, it took on an extremely important and greater significance as African-American soldiers were coming back from World War I and African-Americans were migrating from South to North. So just to read the text for a minute. How are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Perry? How are you going to keep them away from Broadway, jazzing around and painting the town? How are you going to keep them away from harm? That's a mystery. They'll never want to see a rake or a plow. And who the deuce can barley vous a cow? So again, this is an old song, but it clearly takes on a heightened resonance in the moment, in the backdrop of returning soldiers and the onslaught of the Great Migration, how would you all look at this? How would you might teach? How might you teach this, um, given the backdrop? Um, of hey, that's America. a that's a great question. <clears throat> I don't think anybody will look at this song again uh, after hearing it or reading it in this particular context. But Devarian, we've got a lot of really. Uh, good uh, comments and questions here. Let me see if I can find them. Um, the exclusion of Japan from the Versailles Treaty uh, negotiations, uh, one person writes, is just like the founding fathers, avoiding race mm. and slavery in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Another person points out one of these uh, historical ironies. The rejection of Japan at the Versailles Treaty created a Japanese inferiority complex, which leads <clears throat> to its aggressive empire building in Asia, which, of course, leads to World War II. Mm -hmm. Um, and then a question, is there any way to parse out the degree to which the issue was not nations or was it racially driven? And that, that question about nation and race, is there any way to, to uh, can, can, is there any, any way you can, you can split them? Uh, I suppose I, I can't do it by terms of percentage, but which was the dominant here, uh, nation or, or race, national identity or racial identity? Well, I think it's important to understand that they coexist, they, 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 they constitute one another that that, uh -huh. that uh, nation is the political unit through which to organize racial identity on the global stage. Okay, all right. Well, that helps clarify. Rac nation is the political, uh, political entity, political union that, that, that uh, Organ globalizes... Uh, organizes race, organizes race. race. Okay, good. On the global stage. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's all it's right. understand that race and nation, they, they work together. 
Right. And then we have a uh, uh, participant pointing out a confluence between the literary mm -hmm. uh, renaissance mm -hmm. and uh, the more political uh, New Negro movement that you're talking about. Another member of the Harlem Renaissance, James Weldon Johnson, wrote an interesting piece at this time on self-determination in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And let's see, we have some other well, comments. He, he, was the ambassador. Uh, he, was the, he was the ambassador to Haiti. Oh, oh. Uh, can you help us understand why France was more accepting at the time, thinking a lot about the challenges in France today as well? Mm -hmm. Why was French culture more hospitable to, uh, to African-Americans? Mm -hmm. Let's be clear. I'm thinking of Josephine Baker, for right. example. They were, they, were, they, were, they were open and uh, uh, hospitable to African-Americans, but they were mm -hmm. as equally as uh, uh, resistant to their own colonial subjects. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is important to understand that the small colony of African Americans in Montmartre did not Montmartre did not compare to the challenges that would have been wrought against fraternité, uh, égalité, and liberté if they had to deal with their own colonial question in Martinique and Senegal, right. in okay. Vietnam, right? And so it was it was much easier to deal with the with the with the with an oppressed group that they didn't feel responsibility for colonizing, but they were right. equally as hostile to their old colonial subjects. Right, and at that time, their colonial subjects were still in the colonies. Right. They weren't living in the outskirts well, of Paris. They, they were, in small numbers, they were there because some had, had fought in World War I. They had colonial uh -huh. armies in World War I, and many of those soldiers returned and went to, came back to Paris, but such small numbers. Okay, we have some other comments. Uh, participant notes, Harlem Hellfighters by J. Patrick Lewis and Gary Kelly is a great read for younger students. We have a question about how you're going to keep them down on the farm. Uh, was the song written for white people? Uh, probably so, but when you drop it in this context, it, as you say, it, it resonates in an entirely different way. Right. That's, that's the point. Yeah, I mean, it was written for a mainstream audience. I don't know if I can say for white people, but it was written for a mainstream audience. Right. But uh, James Reese Europe, he recomposes it with a jazz style. He gives it a jazz composition, uh, and it gives it new significance in the time period in which he, he um, recomposed it. Right, and then another participant writes also a great new graphic novel, Harlem Hellfighters by Max Brooks. Okay. We have a comment. I actually taught this song today. Oh, wow. But in a more general context of soldiers returning home with broadened horizons looking for more than they had at home. Well, that fits. Our African American soldiers are returning home looking for broadened horizons. Right. Um, the song was written by Joe Young and Sam Lewis. Uh, I have used. What was, Chad is getting a little bit past me here. <clears throat> I've used the song, too, in the general context of soldiers leaving a small town. I think that's how most of us have heard this song. The sight of black soldiers with guns in New York reminds me of the racial incidents in Tampa, Florida, between black and white troops when deploying to fight the Spanish-American War in Cuba. Could you speak more about this issue as it relates to black soldiers in Cuba? Okay. Um, I can't speak directly to that, but if you go back to our slides about the, the 1900 articulation of the New Negro, um, at one time, at, at one level, African Americans understood that the occupation of Cuba and the Philippines could be created as a colony for African Americans. And then there were some, including soldiers, who revolted against transnational imperialism across the board. And so and back in the home front, there were fights between blacks and whites that was actually called um, um, San Juan, the fight in uh, the race riots in 1900 in New York was actually called the Battle Over San Juan Hill, which is a hill in Cuba. They renamed uh, a hill in Harlem, or not in Harlem, in, in, in Midtown um, as San Juan Hill because of the fights between white, white um, immigrants and African Americans. So there's a lot of back and forth in terminology, in experience, etc. Can't speak directly to the actual experience of, Cuba, of, of black American fighters in Cuba, but the way in which those battles around American empire resonated back at home speaks to this kind of transnational lens on what we consider to be a very Harlem-based um, movement and vision. Right. Well, your this, this webinar has done precisely what we wanted to do. It has, it has given people a fresh perspective. One of our participants writes, true, um, the song uh, about, is about broadened, broadened horizons, but now I read, keep them as a power move. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Very different interpretation. Mm -hmm. We've got about a half an hour. Shall yeah, we move ahead? Far. We got a lot left to go. Okay. So um, 
the important point about this is that this 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 song is significant because this is just at the moment where you're bringing the boys back into town, African Americans coming back from war with a, a broad horizon, people were saying, but also just as millions of African Americans had quit the South and were descending on cities all over the globe. So here we have a powerful image. Usually the Great Migration is understood as that very in much more much more in, in economic terms. Um, World War I closed off immigration access to, U to European immigrants, so there was a need for labor. Uh, uh, labor agents looked south, they pulled African Americans north, and they began to work in factories. Now this tells a very different story. This situates the social movement. What do people see when they look at this image of the Great Migration? First of all, it's called the Exodus from Dixie. How do we use this? How can we use this as a way to kind of temper a purely economic analysis of the Great Migration to look at it as from a much more social and political framework? Okay, we have a question here. Uh, is that a ball of cotton that the woman is carrying in front um, uh, on her it. back? I, I, uh, I, I doubt, doubt it. it. It probably yeah. is in her clothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's right. probably trying to get uh, away from yeah. cotton. <laughs> yes, yeah, probably so. Um, let's see. Uh, they're leaving burning, lynching, violence, um, getting the hell out of the South. Right. Uh, this, this image represents flight. Photo of Lincoln, uh, political. Yeah, oh, that's right. You see it right there, uh, sort of slightly to the left uh, center. Photo of Lincoln. I hadn't noticed that. This image shows a lot of emotion, thought, and care, looking back, rallying others, a lot of personal agency. Yep, yep. the uplifted fist there in the center of the uh, image. You see the man on the right uh, raising his fist in anger and violence behind them. Yes, a very, very different image of, uh, of the Great Migration. I think this would make an excellent uh, teaching uh, tool. I, I hope a lot of teachers bring this into their, uh, to their classes. That's right. And if, you, and if people haven't noticed, in the background bodies, right? So just so you know. Um, uh, One of our participants yeah okay fantastic okay great so um yeah this is about um people said agency actions we have to recognize that 1.5 million african americans went north and south but the important point of that story is that there were 12 million african americans in the country so only 10 percent left so this was a concerted decision this was an act this was this this was an effort that most african americans chose to stay and so it's really important to understand this is not just simply being a, a response to forces larger than them, but as a certain moment of agency within constrained conditions. Um, so it's important also to, to situate this globally, that when one million, over one million African Americans left North and West, this followed the flow of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe and from colonial outposts of Asia and the Caribbean, also going to US cities. These population shifts saw the global expansion of industrial capitalism, but also it saw the resistance against both Jim Crow and the new colonialism. Um, so it's important to understand that this, understand, this notion of the Great Migration as a part of a global phenomena was many times placed right alongside of dispatches from anti-colonial rebellions in Ireland in China, in Trinidad, um, at the, this is the same moment as the Mexican Revolution. Um, and this is also um, the same moment as the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. So the Great Migration 1915 is being caught up and is a part of this larger swirl of anti-colonial and anti-gentry movements anti-landed gentry movements that are taking shape all over the globe and people are making connections between what's happening in the U.S. South and what's happening all over the globe. So we have this convergence between the migration and anti-colonial social movements. And in fact, a number of black migrants who went north merely made momentary stops in U.S. cities. 
Some went to Moscow to test the Soviet Union's claims to be a republic without racism and served as agricultural experts out in the rural lands. Some joined and enrolled at the Communist University of the Tolers of the East to get a, a, um, advanced degrees. Others joined the cast and crew of the never completed film Black and White. Others headed to Paris to study the Sorbonne. Um, and then still others went to South Africa to fight the struggle against not yet apartheid, but racial oppression theirs. Others went to London. So this notion of the darker races crisscrossing the world, remapping racial solidarity was not fictional. It was real. And it was happening um, from multiple points of location. But even those who didn't travel, because this was a very small number of those who traveled across the world, who, who kept going at, once they got to the north, even those who didn't travel, those who remained in the U.S., they, they powerfully transformed industrial landscapes all across the country. In sheer numbers, between 1910 and 1930, uh, New York's black population more than tripled, while Chicago's black population exploded from 44,000 in 1910 to 233,000 by 1930. At the same time, 40,000 Caribbean immigrants joined with African Americans to forge the black diversity that became known as Harlem. At the same time, um, college students on black colleges, they became the collegiate arm of new Negro activism at Howard and Fisk in Atlanta. If you don't know, most of the te teachers and all the administrators of these black colleges were white. Um, and there were no black history courses, and most of the most of these um, most of the dorms had white headmasters and, he and headmothers who separated the races as an attempt to keep the so-called primitive sexual urges of black men and women apart. So you had black college students demanding black curriculum, demanding black teachers. Uh, demanding the end to the headmaster and headmistress system, demanding an end to the requirement of having a, uh, a, a an adult um, escort for black women as they went off campus. So you had in the U.S. South um, people fighting against or joining what could be called the collegiate arm of the New Negro movement. While at the same time, black soldiers who didn't stay in Paris came home with a pan-African sense of new Negro militancy. What we don't understand is that while black soldiers were in Europe, they also were in Africa confronting and meeting up with the colonial soldiers from Africa, from the Caribbean, who were fighting for Europe, who were fighting for England, who were fighting for Germany. They got together with those black soldiers and shared stories about both shared and different experiences with racial oppression. So they came back with their own kind of working class sense of Pan-Africanism. As one soldier boldly confirmed, we were the first American regiment on the Rhine. We fought for democracy and we're gonna keep on fighting for democracy till we get our rights here at home. The black worm has turned. And so in fact, soldiers um, joined newly arriving migrants and established neg uh, 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 residents in the fight against long-standing white restrictions on black life. This black, this white resistance to kind of black assertiveness in uh, U.S. cities during the Great Migration led to a, a, a spate of racial violence. Um, an early racial upheaval took place in East St. Louis, the 1917 race riot there, and black New Yorkers took to the streets in a mass silent protest parade down Fifth Avenue. But this white angst and annoyance with a black presence in American cities um, really erupted around 1919 with what James Weldon John, sorry mentioned mentioned him, um, called the Red Summer. Um, black observers who faced white resistance and physical violence against their presence called white attackers the American Hun, a term used to describe wartime Germans. However, when white mobs attacked, black people all over the world fought back in what we can see now as probably the second largest, um, the second national um, explosion of race riots that went as far, as far away as Liverpool, England. This is a, uh, 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 a panel from Jacob Lawrence's The, Great Mi the Migration of the Negro series that represents the, uh, the race riots of 1919. A lot of times what spurred these riots would be um, white um, uh, trolley car uh, 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 
participants or, or consumers, sometimes seeing a dignified black person, either a woman in dress or maybe a black man in a U.S. military uniform, ceremonially, str ceremonially stripping them of their uniform and their medals as a sense of displeasure with the linkage here between blackness and national belonging or blackness and personal dignity. Many times that became race riots in many cities. So this now, vision, if I, if I just, yeah, go ahead. If I can just uh, interject here. Uh, one of our participants has written about the internal colonization within the United States. Would it be fair to say that the Great Migration was a response to this internal colonization. It was America's own version of an anti-colonial uprising, sort of, if you will. Yes, and, and there and there were black there were black and colonial Marxists in Germany and from South Africa who called it that. Actually, you get the first notion of an internal colony by an African Marxist from South Africa who was in Germany who talks about this very notion when looking at the U.S. South. Um, and, and then we have, go ahead. We have a comment here. Um, does this, I, I, I take it, um, the uh, race riots of uh, 1919, this yeah. demonstrates somehow the failure of the ideals of the new Negro movement? Well, no, actually it spurs the, the, the success because the riots were a response to black dignity. The riots were a response to this continual presence of black people existing in the ways in which they were not expected to exist. And, and is the perfect point, this kind of spurs what becomes the more formalized. This is 1919. We situate the New Negro Movement in the 20s. This becomes kind of the capstone to the political notion of the New Negro. As Claude McKay's poem states, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe, though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men will face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. And indeed, after, when, when white soldiers attacked and white residents attacked, black people did fight back, and not just in the North, but also in the South. So this is, a, this is an important touchstone moment where we have kind of the formal articulation of all the threads we've discussed so far, giving shape to a formalized New Negro movement. And in fact, it's out of this moment that we have the injection of new life into older social movements or the creation of new black organizations. So you have the National Association of Colored Women who existed already, but they get it, they gain a new kind of militancy. Uh, at the same time, you have new race groups emerging like the labor focused Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Maids. You have the religious group, the Moorish Science Temple, which is the precursor to the Nation of Islam. Um, you even have a fighting spirit in the small black community in Los Angeles, who was interestingly enough, you had member, you had residents who were members of both the NAACP and Garvey's UNIA. Now in New York and in larger metro, metro, metropoles, these two groups were fighting against one another. But in LA and smaller cities, you had people who were members of both organizations. And then of special note, in the South was a group of black radical trade unionists in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia, of Virginia, of Norfolk, Portsmouth, and Newport News, who organized the National Brotherhood Workers of America, who made clear linkages between a Black economic radicalism and a race consciousness in the South, which clearly challenges the idea, sometimes even adopted by African Americans at the time, that you had to go North to get radical. You had to escape the, the South to get free. Not the case. You had African Americans in the South, in the heart of Jim Crow, organizing, fighting, picking up guns, organizing labor movements, organizing radical uh, race conscious organizations. So this new Negro movement was expansive North and South, in the heart of Jim Crow. At the same time, you had similar formations taking shape in, across, the, across, the, across the diaspora. In Paris, in Havana, you had... You had uh, 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 London's West African Student Union, a picture that we have right here to the right at the bottom. Um, and also, and, and this whole spirit was articulated by two powerful um, messenger magazine. I'm sorry, that's, that's also an image of right here of the Moore Science Temple. So moving on, um, this image, this spirit was powerfully reflected in two 1919 cartoons by the black radical newspaper, The Messenger. On the left, you have following the advice of the old crowd Negro. Here you have a, um, 
uh, uh, black soldiers um, beat down under the shadows of the Statue of Liberty as black leaders, um, including Du Bois, look on as white soldiers and residents beat black soldiers. So this is following the advice of the old crowd Negro because at the moment Du Bois kind of took a conservative tone during World War I and said, well, maybe if we close ranks, maybe we support the war, we can get our dignity and get our citizenship. So this is a, this is a new Negro critique of black leadership. And then on the right, you have the new crowd Negro making America safe for himself. In this image, you have um, a, a car shooting those very same white soldiers and residents with a plaque on the side labeled the new Negro. And in the quote at the top, again, using the German term, the Hun, to talk about white America, giving the Hun a dose of his own medicine. And then not waving the flag of America, not waving a Pan-African flag, but waving a flag that lists all the sites of race riots. So for them, the flag was that of fighting racial oppression. That was gonna be the flag they were planting. That was their, th their, their theme of belonging. So it's important to understand that, that this, where someone asks, is this the, the decline of the New Negro movement? This is actually the kind of catalyst for a formal New Negro movement, where you see much more articulate art, uh, expressions of what it meant. So the point being is that we have this, we've had an hour of discussion about the New Negro movement, and we are just now getting to what we understand as its form articulation, the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah. Right. If I could that. jump in, if I if I could jump in, we have a we have an yeah. interesting question here in the chat. Okay. Um, okay. Were there any white allies in mm -hmm. this phase of the New Negro movement? Now we know in the Harlem Renaissance you had white patrons of the arts, but were there any white allies in this more militant political phase? Right. So certainly. So for example, somebody mentioned the IWW, the Wobblies. Are, was the one was one of the few ra uh, radical groups that understood that to have true radical independence, that nation uh, uh, laborers in the nation states had to link up with workers in the colonies. They were one of the few groups to talk about that. You also had anti-colonial activists um, in Europe, in the U.S., who understood this further, this this larger expanded notion. But they were mm -hmm. few and far between. You know, because right. this. This, this vision was not just challenging kind of white elites, it was also challenging white workers. Mm -hmm. So, now, uh, uh, go ahead. Well, <clears throat> we have another question here. What were other nations saying about race in America? Were they outspoken during the Civil Rights Movement? I think we can defer that last part. That gets ahead yeah. of our, our period here. But um, right. were other, um, what were other nations saying about race in America? Right. Okay. So, um, what you, in some ways, it, it wasn't necessarily other other um, nations talking about necessarily race in America. But again, this was a global moment. America was not the center of the world, and it's, it's important. It's hard for us to understand that. What they were saying was like, oh my goodness, look at the degree to which these darker races across the globe are challenging our spheres of influence. So. We need to dismantle the linkages that anti-colonial activists in the Middle East and in Africa and in the Caribbean are making with these activists in the U.S. But it wasn't so much, oh, my God, look at the U.S. Look at the ways in which these groups are cross -cut, are cutting across nations in the same way that we are to build the, the, the United the League. We need to dismantle this. We need to stop this. They thought about it in global terms. Right, right. Okay, well, we've got about 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, we may run over a little bit. We've got a lot of information, but stay with us, and let's move yeah. ahead, Devarian. Yeah, so if I can just be brief here about this point here is that um, we are just now getting to the, the, the literary and cultural articulation known as the Harlem Renaissance. Um, it's important to understand how all of what I talked about gives context to the formal expression of the Harlem Renaissance. Because most centrally, um, the Harlem Renaissance comes out of, at some level, an anxiety amongst many white artists, intellectuals, and bohemians who witnessed World War I as white-on-white -white violence on the world stage. That at this moment, there was anxiety around the fact that technology, rationality, modernity had all been used for white people to kill other white people. And so therefore, is this what modernity has to offer? So there was this turn amongst bohemians 
to the so-called primitive, to the so-called pre-modern. And who better to express the primitive and the pre-modern in the U.S. than those who are descendants of Africa? And so many, uh, what we might today call slummers, what we're called in that time period, slummers or bohemians, look to Africa and America as a way to soothe what they call the modern machine-ridden and convention-bound society. They, needed, they look to the, the rhythm and the spirit of Africa as a way to soothe their anxieties. So it's in the spirit that the new ne the Negro became in vogue, that the downtown, whites from the downtown went uptown to slum, to, to engage in the, uh, the concrete jungle, to go to the cotton club or the plantation cafe, to engage in the so-called primitive spirit of the African in America. And so this idea of the African as the primitive balm to white anxiety actually gives rise to the Harlem Renaissance in a certain kind of, in a certain, at a certain level. Um, because while African Americans knew this was a very limited understanding of them as being simply as a balm to white anxiety, as a, as a, as a, a, a rhythmic sol a solvent to machine-ridden uh, white civilization, they also understood that as artists, as intellectuals have been trained as such, this might be their only opportunity to get work as artists, as intellectuals. Many of them had been working as domestics or Pullman porters. So this Vogue became an opportunity for those who had been trained as artists and writers to get jobs as sculptors. And so the Harlem Renaissance as a artistic and cultural movement must always be understood as a mix of interracial solidarity, but also as racial primitivism, as this gaze looking at the black uh, kind of spirit and rhythm as a solve as a service to the white world. Um, so this opportunity gave rise to this special issue of Survey Graphic, which was actually a social work magazine that um, was given, a special issue was given to the philosopher John Locke, who was a philosophy professor at Howard University. And he said, well, instead of talking about the Negro as a social, as a social problem, I'm gonna hand it over to African-American writers and sculptors and poets and let them talk about the new Negro, the Negro from the first person perspective. And so as we see in this quote, in these pages without ignoring either the fact that there are important interactions between the national and the race life, or the attitude of America toward the Negro is an important factor as the attitude of the Negro toward America, we have nevertheless concentrated upon self-expression and the forces and motives of self-determination. That is why our comparison is taken with those nascent movements of folk expression and self-determination, which are playing a creative part in the world today. The galvanizing shocks and reactions of the past few years are making, are making by subtle processes of internal reorganization a race out of its own disunited and apathetic elements. Now, Locke was very savvy here because he talks about self-determination and self-expression as a part of the movements of folk expression that are taking over the world. What he's doing is trying to sidestep the political expression of self-determination taking place amongst African Americans in the US and the darker races across the globe because this he knew would not sit well with white benefactors. So he takes all that's going on politically and socially and culturally across the globe and tries to rewrite it as simply a folk expression of self-determination as a means of appealing to, let's be clear, white benefactors. So he takes, and many people say this during the time period, he takes the New Negro as what had been a political and social movement and constrains it to simply being an artistic movement. So let's, don't get me wrong, it was beautiful. The work that was produced in the in the Hannah Rents, as an example, was beautiful work. For example, in this piece, we have a clear statement of saying, well, if the if civilization is the Arc de Triomphe and, and skyscraper buildings, what does it mean to put the Sphinx and the Tower of Babel and the Negro Toiler in the same image as white civilization? These are the gifts that people of African descent play and offer to the world. So this, the artistry, the claim that African Americans should be included within kind of world civilization is a great point, is a great kind of inclusionary moment. But at the same time, let's be clear, it was limiting what the new Negro had previously been from a political and social movement and cultural movement to purely a cultural and literary movement. So it's important to understand how it gets shrinked down 
in the veil of the Harlem Renaissance. And in fact, people were saying in a very clear way that it's, it's odd, it's curious that while we understand the New Negro as being primarily a literary and cultural movement in Harlem, members and residents of the African-American communities in the time period, when they thought of the New Negro movement, they thought of Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican-born um, Pan-Africanist who created the Back to Africa movement in the United States, who was from Jamaica, who actually started out, um, this is important to understand, he started out as a labor organizer in Latin America fighting against United Fruit. Some of you might be um, uh, familiar with the, with the kind of the black national flag. And we think that the red is for the blood, the black is for the man, and the green is for the land. But when Garvey was organizing and creating this flag when he was in Latin America, the red was for the Bolshevik revolution, the black was for the black revolution, and the, and, and the green was for the Irish revolution. And so if you even think about his... His, um, his meeting hall in the US, Liberty Hall. It was named after Liberty Hall in Dublin in the spirit of the Irish Revolutionary Army. So he understood early on kind of Pan-Africanist as ex extending beyond race, but being about colonial subjects, being about a fight against imperialism, which had its own form of racism. And so here again, we see the New Negro as not on a book cover, but as on a placard representing the New Negro as a social movement. And so um, it's important to note that while Locke was waxing poetic about the race question as a world problem, as a folk expression, he was ignoring that at the very same moment, Marcus Garvey was... Um, um, had organized over 25,000 delegates to fill up Madison Square Garden for his UNIA convention. It's important to understand his magazine, his, his, his newspaper article, his newspaper, The Negro World, was disseminated all over the world in multiple languages, as far away as Australia. Aborigines in Australia read The Negro World. That's how encompassing it was. So he was able to assemble 25,000 delegates to his world convention in, in, in Madison Square Garden where they crafted the Declaration of the Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World. Point number 10, we protest against segregated districts, separate public conveyances, industrial discrimination, lynchings and limitations of political privileges of any Negro citizen in any part of the world on account of race, color, or creed, and will exert our full influence of power against all such. Number 45, be it further resolved that we as a race of people declare the League of Nations null and void as far as the Negro is concerned, and that it seeks to deprive Negroes of their liberty. So while Marcus Garvey, and he did become this, is understood as a limited, white-hating, pan, uh, uh, black nationalist, his, 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 his early period, when, when he talked about the, the Irish, the IRA and the Bolshevik Revolution and this declaration of the Negro people of the world was more universal than the 14 points. It was more universal than the American Constitution. It was more universal than the French Constitution. It was all encompassing. It was a universal document that didn't evade race. It took into account race, which is what made it more universal. And it's important to understand that now while he became more insular, in certain ways, he became more insular because he faced the racism of Irish Americans. He faced the racism of Russian Jews. And then he limited his vision to just simply people of African descent. But his broad vision was about this, um, uh, you know, we denounce the League of Nations because it doesn't take into account racial equality and liberty. So it's important to understand, it's really important, I think, to understand that. And it's also important to understand that this notion of self-determination that he put out there was appealing to people, even if they didn't join the UNIA. He appealed to people all over the world with this vision of black or racial self-determination that was not being met by the League of Nations. By, for, for example, Madam C.J. Walker. We think about the new Negro now politically. We think about it in terms of middle brow literature and culture, but let's talk about it in terms of popular culture for a minute. Madam C.J. Walker is a very interesting character, is a very interesting woman. She is known as the first black millionaire. Well, she wasn't, but she was very, very wealthy. She had a mansion on the Hudson in upstate New York. And so when the International League of Darker Peoples put together 
um, uh, 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 envoy to invite the Japanese delegate, what better place to have the meeting than at her, 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 um, her, her mansion on the Hudson? Well, why? Of all places, why? We think about beauty culture is about straightening black women's hair, trying to get them to look white, which is a misnomer. Madam Walker started out, like most black women, as a washerwoman or a domestic. She took the idea of treating black women's hair because black women faced extreme breakage because of poor nutrition and overwork and said, let me treat your hair. Let me treat, let me pamper you. And also, let me give you a labor alternative to being a washerwoman or being a domestic. Let me allow you to make money in your home, in your own home, not serving white people, as a beauty culture, serving your own communities. And so her becoming a member of the ILDP, the International League, was an attempt to put her delegation of black women in conversation with what was going on all over the world. So when one of her ads said, we built the world, we built the globe, a million eyes turned upon it daily. It really, her, her, her transnational or her, her international appeal for her products was about making money. No question about it. But she also was putting in touch black domestics and washerwomen with the darkest politics of the darker races that was going on all over the world. She was putting together this community that wouldn't necessarily be in those conversations. She was putting the platform of beauty culturalists on the globe stage, on the global stage. Her beauty culturalists had to had to be. Uh, uh, she had a, 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 a army of beauty culturalists who were conversant in French and Spanish. Um, she she transmitted her her products all over the globe, and she was clearly for me one of the clearest articulations of a female oriented, a woman's oriented vision of the new Negro. And then finally, to the present. It's important to bring into the present and consider things like Black Lives Matter. It's important to understand that here we have um, the connection between politics and culture and the ways in which this notion of Black dignity in the face of racial violence, in the same way that the New Negro movement was crystallized after 1919, Black Lives Matter and the idea of, of dignity in the face of racial violence, in the face of police, of police overreach, in the face of mismanagement, comes a social movement that is becoming both national and global. It's important to note and to see how members of the Black Lives Matter movement are linking up um, incarcer you know, anti-incarceration politics um, with the surveillance of the dream warriors in the Southwest, meaning those who are considered to be undocumented, who are being racially profiled along the Southwest border. People are making links to the together. So the um, the anti-stop and frisk movement is linking up with the with the dream warriors uh, under the umbrella Black Lives Matter, Brown Lives Matter. At the same time, it's going global, where you have this anti-surveillance, anti-incarceration movement linking up with those people in Palestine and the boycott divestment movement, sanctions movement, saying that in the same way that we have walls along the southwest border, we have walls between Palestine and Israel. And we have the same forms of, uh, we have people of Jim Crow. I have a student who is in the, the West Bank right now who is taking what he's learned in my class on the New Negro movement and also in civil rights movement, and he's doing freedom rides. Because if you don't know, there are um, kind of uh, uh, Israel-only versus Palestine-only buses in the West Bank. So he's, do, he's doing, he's conducting freedom rides where he has Palestinians from his, from he's a teacher at a friend school in the West Bank, riding uh, uh, Jewish only or Israel only buses. So it's important to understand how the, the, the kind of the return of the press, the resurgence of these ideas, the ways in which um, kind of social political uh, uh, articulations of protest, of no more, have to be also articulated in the cultural sphere. That it's important to link the political with the imaginative. It's not so, it's, it's not enough to just simply. Uh, chant and placard, you have to imagine a different world. And I think this is what's critical for bringing back the new Negro movement as both an expansive cultural, political, and economic movement, but also global, is that in a time period of the new Negro movement, you had these dominant visions about the nation, dominant ideas about the worker, dominant ideas about um, self-determination. But the important thing about these new Negroes is that they were imagining something different. They were creating and forging 
the belief that another world is possible. And they were doing so in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, in the intellectual sphere, and also in the cultural sphere, in ways they did not see these things as separate. People who were descendants of slaves, those who had been colonial subjects, those who were under the heel of the, Euro, of the British Empire, those who had been fighting against American Jim Crow, linked up through film, through ship, through text, through newspaper, through journal, in the face of repression, and created visions of another world, the belief that another world is possible. And for me, this is the legacy. This is the usable archive that we can offer to our students about thinking about their present. Thank you. <clears throat> DeVarian, we, we've come to the end of our seminar, but before we do, I want to go back. A participant wrote a comment here that raises an interesting question, an interesting pedagogical question. She writes, I do not know if it takes The, the question I want to pose. Mm -hmm. Quite often, when the Harlem Renaissance gets taught, right. the new Negro movement is almost used synonymously with the Harlem Renaissance. That's right. Would you advise our teachers to separate the two, to talk about the Harlem Renaissance as strictly a cultural uh, phenomenon and the new Negro movement, something that preceded it, more militant, more political? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> would that be a fair, uh, a fair uh, historical distinction to make in your teaching? Actually, what I would say is that the Harlem Renaissance is the intellectual and cultural arm of the larger New Negro movement. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, and I would say, All right. that, and I would say that. So, therefore, but it's important to understand that the New Negro movement precedes the Harlem Renaissance and the degree to. And you, right. mentioned, you mentioned white patrons. It's important to look at people like uh, uh, Zola Hurston and Langston Hughes and their patrons, who literally argued and told them that they would reject their work if it wasn't primitive enough, if it didn't reflect mm -hmm. the white patron's vision of what was authentically Negro, was authentically primitive. And so it's important mm -hmm. to understand that. And so, so, so by situating the Harlem Renaissance within the New York Negro movement, it could be understood as two things, both as a moment of very real solidarity between white bohemians and patrons and black artists, it is that, but at the same time, not getting away from the ways in which it was shaped by this notion of racial primitivism. It's both. It's not either or. Great, wonderful. Well, I, I know uh, um, I know some teachers conflate the two, and I think you've made a wonderful distinction. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our seminar. Let me uh, ask: Are there any questions before we wrap things up? Anything uh, you want to pose to our seminar leader here? Um, meanwhile, while we're waiting for that, Devarian, you said you were passionate about this material and your passion came through loud and clear. Uh, <laughs> you've enlightened us, inspired us, and given us a lot to think about. Thank you very much for an excellent webinar. Thank you. I know it was a lot of content, but I hope people were able to grab some piece of it and are able to build on it. Thank you. Well, I, th I think they did. I mean, if the comments, the, the text, the, the chat, rather, around the... Uh, the uh, Great Migration uh, image there is any indication you've given the teachers an awful lot to carry back to their classrooms. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for your participation this evening. Uh, your intelligent comments and questions really made this an excellent webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, please check back with AmericaInClass.org. Our next webinar is April 2nd. We'll be looking at images of Asians in American culture. Please don't forget to submit your evaluations. Again, Devarian, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much to everybody. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you again. Hope you'll be with us again soon. Thank you very much and good evening. Good evening.